Good afternoon. Um, as I, for those of you who joined us for the earlier entrepreneurship um, session, the, the challenge that we had at that stage was we'd all had lunch and we needed to make sure, despite how dark the room was, that we were staying awake. Um, the challenge that we have now is that myself and my fellow panellists are the only thing stopping you leaving this room and going outside and getting a refreshment in about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, Possibly our, depending yeah, depending how we go. So we'll, 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 see, we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, for those of you who weren't able to join us at the earlier um, session, my name is Eleanor Shaw. I am a professor of entrepreneurship at Strathclyde University. Um, I've known Amanda for, uh, well, <laughs> the thing is, we went to university when we were really, really young. I think we were about nine or ten, so um, we've known one another for quite a long time. And um, I've been doing some work with Open UK for quite some time. Also, as I mentioned in the session before, as a researcher, I'm really interested in all things open. Um, I, I'm interested in communities and in collaboration. Um, you, you may not be aware of this, but now universities have been nudged. They, they need to publish everything open access for the government to then recognise their research. That's a good thing, because the more we can have researchers making available um, the, either their coding, their software, or the data that they've acquired, then the more likely we are to actually solve some of the really challenging problems that we have. So I'm a strong proponent of all things open. As an entrepreneurship professor, I'm also really interested in the journey that founders make from you know, having that initial idea to, to building the proposition to then figuring out what is the business model and then from there on to growth. And we've already started that conversation earlier. And I think, Matt, it was really interesting, some of the things that came out. So we're basically just going to continue that conversation. And um, the plan is we'll be flexible um, for as long as we're all engaging in conversation in this format. We'll let it flow. And then perhaps towards the end, we'll give you the chance in your tables with a founder to perhaps have a bit more of a deep dive into some of the things that we've been discussing and of course, over a drink, you'll be able to continue those conversations. So please allow me to introduce you, first of all, to my co-pilot and panel yeah. member this time, Matt. Yeah. Um, and Matt is oh, your oh, uh, president, entrepreneur in residence, um, or, well, president of Jetstack and entrepreneur in residence yeah. at Open UK. Thank you. Do you want to say a yeah. few words? Hi, everybody. Um, nice to be here. I'm, like I said, I'm co-pilot and maybe passenger as well, because um, I'm gonna, hopefully going to be contributing to this discussion. I've known Amanda for 15 years tomorrow, because mm -hmm. uh, I was, um, as a graduate, I was the, I think the first salesperson, at, second salesperson at Canonical, the, the Linux operating system that Amanda mentioned in the plenary session this morning. I was the one annoying her trying to get the contracts uh, done uh, to hit my commission <laughs> targets. I was very young. Do I need to turn this I like on? To, I still like to think I'm a little bit young. Yeah but maybe not as young as I was. Uh, and You're still very young. Uh, well, no, I was saying I like, I like to think I'm a little bit young. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not young, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then uh, after Canonical was uh, the, well, one of the first salespeople at MongoDB, which um, that was in the, the very early days of MongoDB. It was probably, you know, dozen, dozens of people rather than hundreds. Maybe borrow Amanda's mic because yours is coming and going a little it's bit. Going. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, MongoDB, and that's where I, I guess I learned a slightly different version of, in my head, open source, because Canonical was very much about the, um, it was very much more about the, the sort of, um, the essence of, uh, pure, of pure open source, and whereas MongoDB, I mean, I think someone mentioned it today, it was more of a distribution model, yeah. and, and, a com and how, how you would commercialize the open source, although there was a very vibrant community at the time. And then um, I'm very interested in containers, Kubernetes, and when Kubernetes was open source, start, uh, started a service company, bootstrapped around uh, services for Kubernetes and open source. We created some open source projects uh, in, the, uh, in the process of building that company, and um, one of which became very successful, uh, downloaded millions of times a day, and uh, about three years ago, uh, we were acquired. So I've been through the whole journey, and the topics that we're going to be discussing t today and tomorrow are all ones that I struggle with and have my own personal perspective on. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about legal and corporate requirements today with my esteemed panel guests. 
And on that note, I will hand to Amanda. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO at Open UK. I've been in that role for just over three years. Technically, I am not the founder of Open UK. Somebody else had created a company and a website, but it was pretty much a shell. So I might just about own being a founder and having taken an organization from a few thousand pounds in the bank account to a turnover of a million plus a year in three years during a pandemic. And I'm saying that, I wouldn't normally, but we really struggle to find female mm -hmm. founders. I got a bunch of them through Twitter uh, in December and just then getting them to come to the UK because they were mainly in the Bay Area was really difficult. So I want to own in this conversation being a female founder as much as I want to own having been a lawyer for 25 years, but I'm now in recovery. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Michael, just before we come to you, can I, can I just respond to, to what Amanda said there? And apologies again if you heard me mentioning this um, in the first session. One of the things that I do, I, I sit on the strategic advisory board of something called the Gender Index. Because what we've recognised, and it's particularly in the UK, women are underrepresented as founders by an astonishing level. It's le less than 20%. Um, and I'm being generous when I say that. It's probably about 15.9% if you're in Scotland of all founder-led firms are led by women, and that includes women in partnership with men. So there's a big challenge for us there. And that is despite almost 30 years of government intervention to try to shift the dial. I can tell you why the dial hasn't shifted. It's because they haven't had access to the correct data. They actually haven't had the evidence to be able to inform policies that can shift the dial with all things open, we are getting closer to that now. The tech sector in particular, the, the, the figures are dire. They're, they're absolutely dire um, for women's participation. So I, I think that's a very important conversation for us to have. It is, and we can have it later, but I only did this because I was at a stage in my life where I no longer had anybody that I was responsible for beyond myself. And I think that's the, the fundamental underlying problem for women is that we have commitments that we feel possibly more, uh, well we can talk about it yeah, more we can later, talk about that. I, yeah i definitely yeah. think that that's part of the problem michael you're very welcome to the panel <laughs> please introduce yourself to us either either mike's fine right or yeah either yeah. mike's fine okay okay uh hi everybody i'm michael chain i'm chief legal officer at alaria technologies um alaria is commercializing a suite of technologies that originally started uh out as, uh, as the Google Loon project and was spun out uh, earlier, uh, earlier this year. Um, yeah, so I started out my career as an engineer. Uh, I've done a lot of things, uh, 15 years as an M&A lawyer. Uh, I probably have 200 or so M&A deals under my belt. Um, when I, I was also at Facebook uh, where I switched careers a couple times uh, and ended up as a product manager in the open source team leading open source efforts. Um, and looking, I, I built our static analysis sort of dependency analysis stack, uh, and my team was also responsible for looking into the ecosystem to see how we could support the ecosystem. And one of the organizations that we supported was Open UK um, back in so at you some were, point. You were actually, I forgot about that. You gave me money. Um, you were one of the first to give us money in 2020. Oh, okay. Um, and so, uh, would you like to give us more money? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we've not, got that <laughs> recorded. Somebody make sure you send not, that bit to you. I didn't say how much, but <laughs> you would like to. Yes, I would like You'd to. Like it's to. an intention. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, really. is it an intention or a commitment? Let's get into this legal topic straight away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Rishi Sunak would like to give nurses more money, but you know. <laughs> money from Michael to be honest. <laughs> okay guys so you've got an excellent panel um, of founders here um, so I feel maybe I should kick, kick the first question off if, if that's okay. Um, so Amanda you did mention in your opening plenary the, this morning the, the challenges around regulation and we also had the shadow minister talking about almost like regulation for good yeah. And, and, and how it can be a force for good that can encourage 
innovation, productivity, firm start-up and growth. So I wonder if we could talk about that just as an opener, mm -hmm. um, because one of the challenges that most of the companies that I, I've worked with is, what legal status, you know, how, how do I become a legal yeah. entity? How do I go about yeah. doing that? Um, in many cases, I would say do it cheaply. And in the UK, you can set up a company quite efficiently and cheaply using a sort of bucket shop environment. And you probably don't need a lot more. And I would avoid, I would obviously would recommend taking legal advice, but I would avoid taking huge realms of it right at the start or you'll have no money left. And um, one of the problems that's specific to open source. So Mark Shuttleworth, the founder at Canonical, uh, I've talked to him a few times about giving talks and a, a book chapter that I reference him in a lot. And he's told me he trusts me to, to say things that are appropriate and not to breach too much confidentiality. But I don't think you'll have a problem with me telling you that at Canonical, we were in 46 countries with under 200 employees. We had IBM's problems because open source works on a dispersed basis. And one of the issues we have is that we hire by talent, not by location. So as a lawyer uh, in that environment, you're trying to tidy everything up and learning things like, you know, I think in Germany then you could have 12 individuals working for you before you have to do social registration. Avoid France like the plague, it is too complicated and you don't want to be paying people there because before you know it, you're going to be in all sorts of regulation and works councils and things. And you learn quite quickly if you're dealing with that sort of international environment where you can and can't do things and how quickly restrictions kick in. And it's not the sort of stuff that as a founder you want to be dealing with. You don't want to be dealing with social contributions and employment regulations in 46 countries before you've even broken even. You know, it's a difficult, difficult space. And it, it's something where you can't really just have people working as contractors for you ad infinitum because the the local regulators look at the reality, not what you call it, not how you dress it up. So I think that something very specific to open source is understanding where your workforce is likely to come from, how you engage with them, and how that impacts your corporate structuring. Um, I used to do a lot of IP structuring. Uh, I did that for Canonical, and I also did it as a contractor, a consultant, a law firm lawyer for DeepMind before Google bought them. And again, there are sort of standard ways that people ring fence and protect their IP. There's standard countries that you go to for tax breaks and split that out from your, uh, your general corporate structuring. And what I would say is you want to find somebody, and there are a few lawyers, at least in the UK, who do this, who will know where to direct you simply, cheaply, let you set up a standard thing and encourage you to pick off a list of things that you ought to know about like that without you ending up spending tens of thousands on infrastructure set up at the start, because nobody can afford to do that and nobody knows where it's going. One of the things that, uh, there's a load of stuff, a load of press today around the conference, and one of the, the pieces is about um, a shift in the UK from Tech Nation to Barclays Eagle. Okay. Slightly controversial, I actually think it could be very positive, and I'm quoted on that, and I think it could be positive because Barclays Eagle is very dispersed across the UK. It's got 50 physical locations. It supports startups and uh, accelerator, accelerators, uh, it creates accelerators for startups. And it put 16,000 people last year through training courses. Now the ability to access that kind of modular content and structure that you don't have to go and reinvent is important. And we've already started talking to them about taking some of the work that we've done through Matt and the Founders Forum into Barclays Eagle and putting some open source specific content in there. So hopefully, as well as the stuff we're doing today, you'll see more come out like that. But where you can make it simple, keep it simple and don't make it any more complicated than you have to. Said the ex-lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, and the, whatever jurisdiction that you're in, the sort of cheapest off-the-shelf solution is cheap and off-the-shelf because it's commoditized and it's used a lot. Probably pretty safe, right? And I, I would say that uh, if you go with the safest thing, what looks like the safest thing, uh, and not worry about, there's no problem that your lawyers, if you're successful, there's no problem that your lawyers can't clean up later. Um, but just even going with the thing that everyone else going it goes with, you know, 99% of the chance, 99% of the time, it's going to be fine. 
So don't, I would say, spend very little time thinking about it. I'm going to talk from the perspective of actually being in that position where I have to think about how I'm going to do this and what I'm going to do. And it feels like an absolute minefield. It was so scary because you read in the press these, these conversations or these articles about someone who's been sued for this or, you know, there's, there's IP implications there. There's, uh, we grew up in, in an age, uh, well, I went early in my career. Uh, oh, I said we. <laughs> well, well, well <laughs> when we had uh, we had patent trolls that were you know that all over open source um, all op open source licenses, and I was genuinely scared of doing anything wrong, and uh, I had no money because I was bootstrapped. So I was like, hey, where on earth am I going to get legal advice from? So I I went to one of these off the shelf companies. I set up the, the company, and then I tried to I found a lawyer to, uh, to help me with it. And they were so cheap that they wouldn't respond to my calls. I didn't feel like I was getting good advice. I genuinely felt like in some cases I was getting, I was getting worse advice than I would do by almost doing it myself. I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not even joking. So I, I got so worried about the implications of it that I ended up basically, and this is where I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite lucky in that regard, that I had friends who worked for the big law legal firms. And I, and I took them to the, to the pub basically and just asked them all the questions that I... I, uh, that, that, that worried me, and I, I got a lot of help from, um, from from them to kind of help me navigate it. Um, but without them, and if you don't have those connections, that might be quite difficult. The, the breakthrough for me was that I ended up joining the business, uh, small business federation, and they had a legal team and a bunch of standard off-the-shelf contracts and advice on setting up HR issues commercial law and so on and so forth and I used the templates from that and then uh, used their legal service to help sort of get a little bit of um, a little of help where it was specific to me but I would say uh, yeah I didn't have the money I was worried about the implications of it and I'd say it's, it's not an easy thing to get your head around because I think you over probably overestimate the difficulties um, involved in it and the potential impacts but as we've just heard all, the, all of those can be, can be sorted out at some point in the future, even if you did make mistakes. So don't, don't get too hung up on it and too worried about it. But from experience, it is, it is quite easy to get overwhelmed when you've got no experience or background in, in law. Okay. Uh, can I just what? pick up on something Matt said, just that I think is useful? So I haven't had a chance to invite the Federation of Small Businesses to come to this event this year, but we have done some stuff with them in the past. And for those in the UK, they do offer quite a good suite of things, and their membership's only a few hundred quid a year. But there are also all sorts of equivalents. And the Barclays Eagle thing, I think, is that, you know, it's going to be in place for at least a couple of years. If you want to tap into resources about things that are standard, like setting up a company, I, I think that those kind of resources are things that you should definitely tap into. Yeah, and, and, and to, to add, can you, you can hear me here. To, to add to that, if this is just in Scotland, but I would imagine, and it's unusual for something to happen in Scotland before it happens elsewhere. Uh, but complementing the work that Barclays are doing in Scotland, the, the government has, in, has launched a joined up network of tech scaler incubators, um, supported with a, a budget of 43 million. It's, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not an awful lot of money to deliver what it's doing. Um, but that is in conjunction with Codebase. So if any of you are you know, in Scotland or up and around Scotland, go and have a look. And many of, of the, much of the delivery of that is through Barclays. Absolutely, and something that Matt may either not know or have forgotten is that that organisation, which was set up with Martin Logan in Scotland, is looking at the Founders Forum at Open UK as being mentors, because they specifically want to get mentors from outside Scotland. And I think that kind of mentoring thing, there's probably still a form in the Founders Forum page, we'd have to have a look and check, but the access to things like mentors is something that I can't recommend enough. In my career, when stuff has gone really wrong, it's when I've not had somebody that I could go and talk to to guide me. And I think access to mentors is available for people. And if we're, if we're signposting, there is also the UK government-backed Help to Grow programme. Is anyone doing Help to Grow? No, not here. Okay, so Help to Grow is massively subsidised. I mean, I, 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 you pay a very small amount of money to do a 12-week incubator programme and you're, you're matched with a mentor on that. So these are resources that are out there and you should definitely be exploring. Um, and you don't just need to use one of them. You know, you can use all of them. Do, do they ask for equity in return or not? No. No. That's a, no. That's no. a good topic. Yeah, OK. Will we talk about equity? Do we want to? Yeah, OK. Uh, one of, there's a question here. Sorry, can I just quickly ask um, regarding the, the challenges or... Oh, thank you. 
um, regarding the challenges of um, trying to develop and um, be agile and not worry about the legal stuff, how do you kind of de-risk it? Um, are there like insurance, like founder insurances? I mean, um, later on, hopefully the, the lawyers would be there to cover it up, but <laughs> <laughs> any de-risking anyway? I, um, so I did a lot of research on insurance and I wouldn't say there is like specific founder insurance unless one of your co-founders was to pass away or die. <laughs> And I think there is some kind of like insurance that that paid out in that. I did a lot of research. The best at the time, and this was eight years ago, was Hiscox. And Hiscox had a uh, like an entrepreneurship or a tech focused insurance policy. So I got things additional that I could add on. I hope I'm am I allowed to talk about this? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you get you get the equivalent of being able to pay for, for example, cyber insurance, which you didn't I didn't you didn't have the opportunity to to, to get with other um, in, insurers at the time. So. That, that there, there will be lots of you know options available, but I, at the time I did research and found one that was specifically useful for tech companies and tech entrepreneurs. And so yeah, I was worried. For example, if we got breached, GDPR came in at the same time, so I had to do a lot of work around that again, which I got help from the Federation of Small Businesses with. So um, there are specialist providers, but around something going brutally wrong, I don't think you know I don't, there's, there's much that's going to cover you. Oh, the, the Federation of Small Businesses also included coverage for if you got a HMRC inquiry or a um, or, or sued by someone. So you actually got a certain amount of coverage insurance from them. So I was kind of like double protected by the Hiscox and also the, the Feder being the, in the Federation of Small Business. Michael, you got some views on that? I think the insurance is called a trust fund, right? Um, <laughs> no, there is, there's definitely no, no insurance. Uh, I would say the best insurance is the simplicity in your interactions, right? In, in the structuring of how you structure whatever it is that you're structuring, right? And so I obviously wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but we've, I've definitely encountered cases where the, f the founding team is very small and they have an extended group of contractors right, who are just contractors and there's a, the relationship is contractual in nature. Obviously that goes back to the issue, there are fundamental issues of fairness and equity associated with that. But from a you know, acquisition perspective, that was not certainly a difficult thing to clean up, right? To, to then figure out how do we get folks equity you know, as part of the acquisition. Um, but the, the, the simpler the, you know, the, the relationships are, right, I think the, the, the simpler, that, that's I think one of the best forms of insurance. So just give me two seconds. So we're not um, allowed to give you legal advice and I can't technically because I'm no longer a solicitor. But when you're looking at this kind of stuff, uh, keeping it simple, as Michael was saying, is key and not being intimidated by it, but also not being somebody who's doing things with unhealthy bravado. So being measured in your approach matters. Um, in terms of things like contracting and corporate structures and insurance, you are not licensing your software. You're open source founders, right? So you're not ever licensing the software. What you're doing is providing service agreements of whatever form it is that goes with the software license. So you're not building licenses into your contract. You want to find a simple form of service agreement where you attach whatever services you're doing. There will be some sort of nuance with the difference between something like subscription and straightforward support contract, which you're going to have to work out, but that's going to be a few clauses in a contract. There is a thing called the risk grid, and you can find it... Um, if you look up Andrew Katz's risk grid, it'll probably come up on Google. There's a link to it in the book that I edited last year, which is available open access... And it has a sort of measure of what's fair and balanced in this grid and shows you what you would see in a traditional contract and what you would see in an open source one as a guide. And, it, you know, it's freely available. It's on, I think it's CCSA. Um, also, the book has legal advice in it, which you may or may not be able to understand. Uh, McCoy, who's one of the authors, is in the room. He did copyright and patents chapters. It's technically not available to you for commercial purposes free. It's available to you for non-commercial purposes free. Um, how we would ever know, I don't know. But you can go online to amandabrock.com and it's very, very clear where you get the open access version and download it and just use it. And we tried very hard to index it so you would find the things that you wanted. So specific things about you know, the corporate piece. 
Uh, Toby Crick, who was somewhere around the conference, wrote the M&A chapter, and I think it's pretty readable. Uh, in terms of equity, don't give any more away than you have to, because someone will come and take your organisation away from you later. Um, well, they will. That's what they do. You know, I mean, it's not guaranteed, but I mean, it's really difficult. The more you give away, the harder it will be to retain. And tomorrow afternoon, I know that, I think, Peter, you were talking with Guy Pajani about uh, investment and equity, or are you doing the, you know, you're doing business models. Guy later is talking about investment. And we've got people who have companies where they've taken no investment and grown them, and we've got people who've taken massive investment, and it's all very different. I'm just going to give you it. On the insurance piece, before I forget, you're legally required to have employer's liability insurance, you want to have public liability insurance. You might want professional indemnity insurance because your contracts will require it. And you need to have directors and officers insurance. And when you get directors and officers insurance, the thing to look out for is that you're entitled as a director to appoint your own lawyers, that you don't have to rely on the same lawyers that the company has, and that you have a choice that you don't have to use the insurer's lawyers. You may not easily get a policy that says that, but you want the right to choose who's going to represent you if you've done something wrong, because ultimately, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Right? So I don't want to scare you. Most of this is straightforward and simple, but put those in place, and if something goes wrong, you're mostly protected, or as much as you can be. Just, just one point I wanted to add uh, that connects to all of that you were saying is that I used to look with, um, with real envy at the beginning, starting JetStack, with friends who'd started companies that were VC-backed because they would get all of the best advisors, they would get connected to all of the top law firms, and a lot of the, the kind of the risk was, was kind of outsourced to, to that cadre of, of advisors and legal and finance people around them. Obviously, I'm, I was bootstrapped and I was using my own money, and so I didn't have that luxury, but I personally was more protective of my equity than I was over getting the best, the best lawyers. And like for me, that worked, and that's what I wanted to do. So I'm a big proponent of, of being bootstrapped, but I would say that if you take on investment and you take it from a reputable firm that, that has that, those connections, then you're likely gonna, it's gonna be less of a, of, a, of a worry for you than maybe doing it bootstrapped. But, um, but, it, but you're going to have other stresses <laughs> by taking the VC. So, yeah. um, I mean, th this was something that came up in the earlier conversation that we had this morning. And I th one of the things that strikes me is that within this community, and all the panellists that we had this morning said this, they were able to secure VC funding really e very, very easily. Okay, I work with companies across all sorts of sectors, including medtech, and I've seen some amazing propositions which... Medtech cannot get VC to, to invest in them, okay? Different risks, all the rest of it, but really challenging. So I, I think it's really important to recognise that this community with, and we talked about it again this morning, with the, the vision, with the proposition, with the traction, is able to secure quite a lot of VC funding, if that's the way that you want to go. And I've seen this happen. It's very easy at that stage in your journey to secure the VC funding. And actually, it can be a little bit addictive because you can get funding from so many different places. That's almost the easy part. Once that funding then lands into your bank account, that's when the pressure's on because you have to deliver what you've committed to doing. And... You, you know, I, 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 I agree with what Amanda said. It, it's so important I was just about to, to say up. that was quite a flippant remark that I probably shouldn't have made and I'm tired. But I have seen a number of yep. people lose their businesses because they've fallen out with the investors. Yep. Even co-founders, they've fallen out with co-founders and they've not had enough of the equity despite the fact they've worked yeah, I've seen so that hard happen, And they've so lost long. their companies and it's tragic when that happens. Um, so I'd, I'd be very careful. I also know some enormous companies that are probably about to be billion dollar babies and they've done it without any VC funding at all. So, you know, there is a choice to be made. It, it, it isn't, you know, it, it, you, you, can make, you can make your own choice, um, I think. Any views on that? Michael? Yeah, the co-founder thing, that's, that's the worst. That's, you know, lawyers run for the hills when you have a co-founder problem. Uh, those are really intractable. Those are really hard to sell. So I would say um, the, you know, forestall having a co-founder for as long as you possibly can. And then when you do, the level of um, 
diligence and values alignment uh, would be probably orders of magnitude greater than what you would need for like first couple dates or you know it's it's just it's it's so important um, I've I've done myself a number of businesses where we didn't completely align on what we wanted to do and uh, and 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 we're kind of at an impasse now and it's it's really painful because we put in all this work and it's not you know not going anywhere yeah. So the way I would look at that, and I've had the same experience and things that I've been involved in sort of instigating and then realized that my values didn't entirely match the person that I'd done something with, including being married, um, is that it's actually very like being married. And you probably spend more time with your co-founder than you do with your significant other if you are building a business. And actually, money can change people. And the prospect of money can change people. If you look at how that works out in families with disputes over wills and properties and things, with co-founders, it's not that different. And if you are going to co-found, you really have to think about who you're doing that with and how well you know them and where your end goals and values are and the stages that you're at in your life. Because a few years in, things might shift dramatically for you depending on family situations, all that sort of stuff. But uh, that is one space where if you are going to co-found, I would make sure that you have a very clear prenup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, 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 to counter that, what we also know is that where co-founding works really well is the, the shared values and purpose have to be there. It's really difficult to co-found if, if you don't have that shared, that shared vision, purpose, values, okay? But where it works really well is when you're bringing different things to the table. And we, we also know that when different things are brought to the table, and so I'm talking here about different amounts and types of human capital you, that, that, you're, that you're bringing, and, and where there is diversity and it comes together, that can create a really strong partnership for the company be, because you're not having to go outside looking for either ex, to make expensive appointments to bring in that, that expertise or to create a board or some sort of advisory community around you. So I, I think... That's a really important consideration in looking for a partner, if that's what you want to do, to, to, to think, OK, where are my vulnerabilities? Who can I bring in as a co-partner that can work really well? Yeah, I mean, there's not much to really add because you've, you've, you've made some great points. But I'd say from the ad hoc conversations I had with founders at the time I was looking for mentors to try to get an inside insight into what they what happened to their business, and there were some, there were some great ones who shared so many horror stories with me, uh, to be honest, and that, that actually helped me much more than the, the success stories, but the um, probably top of the list of failed companies was product didn't land, didn't work, you know, um, not enough effort went into it. Second one was actually founders falling out, I think that was the second one, and then the yeah. third one was probably issues with the investor or, or VC. So those, like, my, in my head, those, those are the, the priorities. And you mentioned it as a, as a prenup. I think it sounds, it's easy to get swept away in the early days of the excitement of starting a company that you forget to maybe just sit down and have that conversation about what the shareholder agreement looks like, what the paperwork looks like, what the equity is going to look like, what, you know, what it's gonna ha what's going to happen at this point, what happens if something changes in my, in my life circumstances. And so it's really annoying <laughs> and boring to do. And you might, if you do find a co-founder and you have to sort of, um, you know, you, You've, you've started to find your first customer. That's all you want to talk about, or you, you know, you've just you've just seen some excitement in the open source community because you've got a project that's starting to take off. Just just like slow down a little bit and just like have that that conversation and just say, let's sit down and like pre-agree what's going to happen as an outcome, and let's get this down on paper because you want to be able to have the confidence, and you both want to have the confidence for both of your your benefits or the three or four of you that, that you've got it in writing and it's there because you can refer back to it. You can always change it, but at least it's there. So you said the F word, failure. Um, I haven't been in the other session. I, I was at something else. And I'm going to say that it's okay to fail. Now, that's all very well saying that. I was absolutely panicking this morning sitting in that room when there were like 20 people at 5 to 10 sat down because you were all having coffee outside. And I didn't feel like I could afford to fail by nobody turning up, right? I've got all these people who've sponsored this, who I have a commitment to, who I owe things to. I've got hundreds of people who've contributed so had it stayed with 20 people in that room, I would have been devastated, but I would have lived. And I, uh, I mentioned who? Damani. I met Damani in Nevada at the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit, and I had to fly back via San Francisco and spend an afternoon in San Francisco or San Francisco Airport. 
And I, I went and met uh, someone from the financial sector and I made him go out on the ferry with me because I hadn't been in San Francisco for years. And we just went round in a circle talking about founders and talking about um, failure and the US tech sector. And one of the things I'd seen in the, the six months I've been back engaged in open source and traveling was that Austin has skyscrapers and people are moving from the Bay Area to Austin. So I was asking him if I, there was going to be this shift away from the Bay Area in the US. And he said to me, no, there's not going to be because the rest of the US does not do risk. It's a Bay Area specific behavior. They don't understand risk and they don't like failure. And I hadn't understood that. I thought it was an American versus a British cultural thing. And it was why they were so much more successful than we are in uh, scaling startups. And uh, he said to me, you know, you, you walk around San Francisco, you meet people and they'll tell you that I've had 10 startups. And he said, if you say that in London, you're a failure. You've just not had a successful startup. And I think that shift uh, and that, you know, Matt, when I met him when he was a young man, was very, very diligent and very keen to do the right. I'm not joking that you were. You were one of the better people as a lawyer to deal with because you wanted to do the right thing. and You'd come to me. You know, well done, Matt. Um, but you did. And a lot of people aren't like that. And you just have to think about trying to do your best, trying to do the right thing, but not let it inhibit you actually moving forwards. Because the, there's some phrase about perfection as there's something of delivery. I don't know, I can't remember what it is. But there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's fine to be good. It's fine not to be perfect. But if you spend your time paralyzed by trying to get all the legal and corporate stuff right, I'm not saying don't. Try to get it right. But you need to move forward and have a business to found. And don't get you know, weighed down in all the legal stuff. And also accept that you might not succeed in the first attempt or even the first few attempts, but keep going. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we can talk about failure for, for a little bit. I, you know, I, I would challenge, it's not just the, the, the Bay Area. I, I think also, if you, you know, I've worked at MIT for some time. I, you know, I've, I've seen people fail a lot. And it, it, means, it, it just means something different. It's seen as learning, okay? That didn't work out for you. What did you learn? And what are you going to do differently next time? The challenge we have in the UK, I strongly believe, is, is education and how we educate young people at school is to pass exams and if they don't pass exams they have failed oh, that's a dreadful dreadful it, it, it stamps out curiosity an inquisitive mindset you know an open an open mindset you know we're talking about open I, I actually think open mindset should be something else that we add into this equation because I think it's such a powerful force for good if we can have that um, so yeah we shouldn't worry about failure, but what we should worry about is learning from it and what we do next. As a parent, you can't teach your kids to walk without them falling down. I mean, it's ridiculous that we think failure is, is, is so problematic. This gentleman's got a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask kind of an off-centre question, if that's all right, because it just came into my head there. Um, and I don't mean that this is what founders set out to do. But when we look at, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks, etc., and then I suppose I'm looking at from Ireland maybe in the 90s, where certainly a lot of indigenous companies were set up, and it was fantastic because people came home from the 80s, you know, because normally Irish people immigrate, because <laughs> normally we didn't have jobs and different things. But then people came home, there was a big impetus in the 90s, a lot of small indigenous companies were set up, and then they all disappeared. Um, what I mean disappeared is they never got a chance to move on to be, you know, the bigger company, that Google or the, the Facebooks that came after in the States. And I just wonder sometimes, you know, I think it's amazing the way people set up companies. But really, is there a ceiling for companies where eventually the goal is we need to be bought out? Mm. Or do you set out, when you, when you, when you set out in your journey, do you go... You have these high morals of I'm going to have this company and it's going to rock the Casbah and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have offices all over the world. Uh, maybe it's a bit of an unfair question, but yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I'm happy to come in first of all. So what specifically happened in Ireland was that there was a crowding in effect. The tax regulations that the Irish government decided to introduce were initially beneficial to small entrepreneurial startups, but they then became beneficial to large global players who, you know, who 
financially in all sorts of ways benefited so there was a crowding in which then made it incredibly difficult for a lot of smaller firms to, to remain on that growth trajectory um, be, because as those big companies crowded in rather than thinking we can create uh, lots of local supply chains here and that will actually um, grow the pie for everyone th there was a lot of quite unpleasant competitive behaviours so I think that was a very unique set of circumstances that happened there as far as the what do you want the the sh should we set up a company to then to grow it and to sell it we started to talk about that mm -hmm. tomorrow uh, sorry uh, earlier yesterday this morning <laughs> where am i i'm in so many different time zones i can't remember where i am um and i think what we saw in the room this morning was it's really diverse it it, it depends mm -hmm. what your vision is i can talk about my personal experience and that is that i never expected to sell just like my company, I felt like it was gonna, I was going to do it forever. I think uh, once you've done six years eating glass and staring into the abyss, which is what Elon Musk sometimes refers to as starting a company, it was, um, I'd basically not paid myself anything for, well, very little for a number of years. I had a young family. I was in a small flat in London, and um, I went to see investors because I, I've, I'm not against taking investment at the right time for the right reasons, by the way. I mean, although we talked about it uh, before, that it can sometimes you know, lead, to, lead, lead to issues. But um, the investors that I was speaking to were saying, we've created this great business, but it's all service revenue. So we're not that bothered about that because it's, it's not valuable enough. What we want is annually recurring revenue and we want subscription revenue and so on. So we think that you should flip take your open source project, create a product around it, and just go for ARR. But you probably don't need the service anymore, so you can transfer the engineers to the product strategy. And, you know, but then I was like, that's the end of the, 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 the service business that we've created. And you know, we've got this great culture, and we're doing amazing things, and we're, we're learning together with all our customers, and we're innovating, and we're creating, new service, we're creating new open source projects that we want to continue doing. And then the service investors were like, you can do a buy and build strategy. You know, we'll give you the money. We'll go and buy all the boutique cloud native um, consultancies, but to me, it was um, it, both of those options with investment or just continuing anyway would almost like um, going pushing foot. My, my risk was going higher and higher and higher, um, and it got to the point where, like, with a second, you know, kid being planned and so on, like, it was it was very difficult to, to sort of to have, to take, have the stomach basically to think I'm going to go in and do another five years and and you know who knows what's going to happen with the economy? Who's going to know? Who, who knows what's going to happen with the interest rates? Who knew that the pandemic was going to happen? So we actually started talking at the end of 2019 to, to, um, to our, our, our now acquirer, who's our parent company, and they, they understood the vision, they bought into it, um, you know, they, they enabled us to continue to build out the product but keep the service business and, and help that support the product. So it was the perfect outcome um, for me, uh, uh, but it was, it was a lot of it honestly was driven by personal, mm -hmm. uh, personal drivers rather than, and, and then I've got other friends who are founders who are like, yeah, I, I got to a point where I could have probably taken it past, but in the UK, it's hard to go past a certain, a certain level. We get out-competed by our US uh, brothers, cousins. <laughs> I don't know what we call them. Um, and, and, and his dilemma was if he wanted to do that, he would have to move to the US and try scaling it there. He ultimately ended up uh, being acquired, but he got out-competed by his largest competitor in the US. And so he was, he was kind of... His ceiling was was definitely was definitely there, but he saw that as a as a as a as a, as, as a reason of um, as a factor of him not wanting to move to the U.S. to to, to scale out there. But I mean, you're, you're obviously in the U.S., um, Michael. You might have some. I'm going to hand this over to Michael in just a second. Some of the things we're talking about are about your personal life and your personal decisions. Right? It's not just about being a founder, and actually, they apply equally if you're an employee. And I think we, it's worth just taking a minute and putting that into context. So when I left Canonical, I wanted to stay in open source. There were no other jobs for a lawyer at my level in Europe in open source at the time. It just didn't exist. It, it had no traction. And I didn't want to move to the Bay Area. I didn't want to move to the US. I wanted to stay in the UK for all sorts of personal reasons. So I made the same decisions. In 99, 2000, I was in a startup that was a spin-out from Dixon's The High Street Retailers FreeServe. And I think it was the biggest IPO in Europe, and it was the first IPO in Europe, and I made £2,000. I was one of a team of 12 that took it through IPO, and it was so early, we didn't know what... I don't laugh. Uh, we didn't know what to ask for. But when I left Dixon's, I had hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of shares underwater. And that can happen to you as an employee, it can happen to you as a founder. You know, it's just life. There's no point in worrying about it. 
it, it depends on what you want. And I, I think that not every startup also has to be about becoming a billionaire. You know, people do things for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, you don't all have to have startups. There's lots of really good jobs and companies that people can do without having a startup. But what you do need to do is you need to understand if you want to work in open about the business of it and about the nuance and the special things that apply to open source. Um, there's a gentleman there in white who also wanted to ask a question, okay. but I think Michael wants to come in first. But let's go to Michael and then we'll go to this gentleman and then this gentleman. Yeah. Oh, we'll make it easy. This gentleman, this gentleman, this gentleman, this gentleman. That means the mic can go in that arc. Yeah, so the personal dimension I would also say is, is probably, you, you could draw inferences about geographic differences, but if you look at the personal dimensions of these biggest, these, these very, these original founders, right, they weren't exactly poor to begin with, right, and they had the families, a lot of them had the families to support them through whatever they wanted to do, right, and that, 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 that in itself was, I would say, probably the most important factor for some of these folks, right, and, and so I think that's much more of a controlling factor relative to, you know, whether, whether, what, what jurisdictions they are in, right. Obviously, I think the LPs and the VCs are, have so much dry powder now that they're in many ways no longer acting. They're, you know, the ones in the US, they're no longer in many ways picking bets. They're almost acting, they're almost operating as index funds at this point, right? Where they're betting on everything. And when they're betting on everything, it can seem like the money is easier, the bets are bigger. Um, and so I, I would definitely say that, you know, the, the disparities and the opportunities of funding are, are, are definitely a lot greater between, between continental Europe and, and, and the UK versus the US now, even, even more than it was before. Okay, thank you. I think this gentleman over here wanted to ask. Hello, yeah. um, I'm Joe and I'm a student and I'm currently on the precipice of uh, trying to found something out of a project that I've been working on while I've been at uni. Um, and I'm in the camp of not wanting to just kind of grow and grow the company. I just want to make the product into something that people use. And so I'm not too worried about having immense funding. I just want a few other people to also work with me on my project. Um, and so I intend to start the company as a limited by guarantee rather than by shares. Um, and I, just because in my mind, that removes all the questions of uh, greed because I can't, and other people can't uh, be, corrupt by, be, be corrupt by money. Um, and it's sort of a, a preemptive action. But obviously that's, that's me having never done, not even left uni yet. So I was wondering what, my, what, what your insights might be onto my idea. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? Uh, I'm 22. 22. Um, it's interesting. So I would tell you to pe speak to Peter Zeitstav, who's sitting there. And I would also tell you to... Ron is not in the room. Ron is launching something upstairs just now. Ron from Nix. And Nix have got a, a table on the fourth floor. Go and speak to him as well. And he's got a, a foundation as well. And maybe Gail, uh, who's just over there. Um, I'm trying to see who else. I haven't got specs on. Uh, it's... It's a big decision. Um, Ron also knows and was trying to get Mitchell Hashimoto from HashiCorp to join us, which I hope we'll manage to achieve next year. And when HashiCorp was set up, it wasn't set up to be a, you know, a big corporate. It was set up to be a project. If you were setting something up now and you want it to have longevity, even as a project, you are going to have to fund it. You are going to, you know, you might hate money. You might not be interested in making money. In Canonical, we came up, I don't know if uh, there's somebody else from Canonical here. I don't know if either of you remember, but we came up with this phrase in a training session to pay for our own excellence because we were, you know, we were excellent. We worked really, really hard to create these great things and somebody had to fund it. And we didn't want it to be our founder forever, but he was personally wealthy and able to do so and somebody has to fund it, so you have to be able to access cash. So I would be careful about how you structure that and how you restrict yourself at an early stage. At the same time, I think it's very laudable, and I'm all for more collective equity in tech and you know sharing, but I would be tempted to put the IP in it. Uh, don't set up another foundation. Work out if you have a business model that you can make viable for whatever the project is before you structure it 
and I would talk to a few founders and a few people in foundations who can give you some input onto how suitable what you're setting up is for that. Because if you set something up and you've given it away, it could make you very, very bitter. Um, he is downstairs recording, and I, uh, you know, there's lots of great podcasters here, but Mike, uh, I can't remember if it's Schwartz or Schultz from Glue and Open Source Underdog, so I don't think is in the room, is downstairs and was in the session this morning. Open Source Underdogs has got the most amazing catalog of founders. I know Peter's in there and others in the room who have talked to him about their experiences. And, you know, listen to one a day for a couple of months before you make a decision. And I think Mark Shuttleworth uh, describes it as being a very emotional thing where you've enabled your competitors with your own innovation. And that was a bit of a roller coaster for us at Canonical back in the day, right? It wasn't easy. And we were one of the first organizations to find that our product was in the cloud and we weren't necessarily making a lot of money from it. So, you know, I really think through what might happen to what you set up at the same time as I think it's really laudable. Yeah, it's a it's fundamentally a irrevocable decision, right? And you can do the for profit thing first and then move that to a non profit thing later once you're successful, right? Doing the uh, public charities, Swiss shift tons, like those things, I, it's pr probably pretty difficult to get stuff out of those things. It's probably a rev irrevocable decision, right? And so, um, a lot of companies, a lot of foundations actually end up setting up for profit, comp co you know, subsidiaries and related entities exactly because of. Just from an operational perspective, it's very, very restrictive. Um, and so going back to the question of like capital efficiency, going back to all these questions, it's, it's definitely, definitely start with the easiest thing first uh, and then figure it out as you. But again, it's, it's a commendable. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know um, I'm not familiar with the, with the corporate structures here, but in the US, we have something called the uh, Public Benefit Corporation. Um, some people have done that. Uh, it's, it, it comes with its own complexities, um, but there might be some half measures in between that, that might make sense. So uh, in the UK, we've got a company limited by guarantee, as you know, and Open UK is a company limited by guarantee, which is the right thing for a, an industry organization, I think. We're not a kick. Lots of people set up kicks, community interest companies, and frankly, we're not because it's complex and it creates a load of admin we don't need to do. Um, we're, we're structured in a way that it's fine as it is. Um, I, I would just be very, very careful of setting something like that up straight away. You, you've always got forever to change it. Not much to add, although I would just say that it sounds like one of those things that you're not going to get cleared up by a lawyer after the fact. <laughs> so just be really careful with what you decide to do. Okay, thank you. Can we go to our next question? Um, this gentleman here. Hi. So I, I kind of have a double question, um, but it's all around this kind of subject. So I, I'm really interested in one of the earlier comments that I think Matthew made around uh, VCs and VC funding, and I found that quite interesting. And the kind of question there was, are VCs kind of destroying or are they a risk to open source? And before you answer that, a totally different question would be, is there a way of um, rather than creating a copyright to protect your IP, um, using trademark as a protection mechanism. So, I mean, when you look at like Red Hat, they use their trademark as a protection mechanism, right? But does that, how does that complement copyright or replace or not, or all of that kind of stuff. So it's, again, it's how do you monetize around the IP? Um, and I, but I think the question so, about VCs is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, so um, I'll pass you back to Matt on the VCs. But on the IP side, copyright, trademarks, patents, all totally different. Patents protect innovation. When you get it, you get a monopoly. You get a monopoly which is supposed to reward that innovation, and you get it for a period of time. You have to demonstrate that it was novel at the time that you applied for it. Not used as much in Europe as it is in the US. McCoy's already got his head in his hands because I'm giving you a potted, read his book chapter if you want it in much more detail. Um, but once you've got it, you can stop others from using your idea. 
Uh, not something that will go down well with the open source communities. You can take something like that and put it into Open Invention Network or one of the other co collaborative pools to allow the open source communities access. Copyright, you can't make it apply or not. It just applies, and it applies in the specific work that you've created, different ways of protecting it in different countries. You'll generally get life of the author plus, I think, 70 years now in the UK, uh, whether you want it or not. And because you have it and it just exists and you don't have to do anything to get it, it's why we have software licensing. So yeah, the license, I, I, let me, just let me finish. So the licensing works in copyright. It may also cover patents, but it will definitely cover copyright. So your, your software, your open source license will cover that. You, you shouldn't be so concerned about that. Your trademark, on the other hand, and I can't remember who said it this morning. It's been a long day, but someone talked about trademarks and open sourcing the trademark. I do not recommend that. A trademark is a badge of excellence. It's a way you recognize the excellence in something. So if I see Percona or Ivan behind a product, I know that that's come from an excellent house and that I, rec you know, I, I recognize that branding and I have a level of trust with that. You want to protect that. If you have a community and you do your double whammy where you've got a, 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 a not-for-profit or some sort of foundational model plus a commercial sponsor model, the trademark has to somehow be shared. So we've, we've registered a state of OpenCon and we've registered Open UK. Not because we want to do anything aggressive with them. You know, we're not a, we're a not-for-profit, but because we want to protect our rights and we don't want other people passing us off. Now, passing off is a whole different concept. It's where someone looks like they are you and confuses the consumer. A trademark is something that is very specific and it can be infringed by others using your mark and um, looking like they're you so you can enforce against it. When you have that not-for-profit plus for-profit element, you're, like we had this in Ubuntu. We had Ubuntu communities all over the place and they needed the ability to use the trademark. They needed to be able to register a company to get a bank account and to be able to sign contracts and have a legal entity and it not to be in the individual's uh, name, which isn't right. But they also needed a shot as we would say in Scotland, they needed a wee shot of our trademarks. They needed to borrow our trademarks. And we set up an infrastructure that allowed it. I used to recommend the Mozilla uh, trademark policy because it, it does a really good job of sharing trademarks as something to replicate. Uh, Pam Chestick wrote the chapter in the Open Source Law Policy Practice book. She is sort of the doyen of trademarks and open source. So you'll get advice from that if you want to have a look at it or you'll get, it's not advice, you'll get um, information about trademarks in that. But I, I'm a very strong believer that your trademark is one of the few things that you have when you've given away your assets, open source, to protect your integrity and your business. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to clarify. When I said uh, copyright, what I really meant was if you open source your code, as an example, or Creative Commons, your document, you're giving access to your... Uh, IP in the uh, non the non patent sense. I'm going to say you're you're giving access to that that work. Can you then create a business around the fact that you're using your trademark as a way to kind of control or monetize that, rather than instead of just saying, well, I'm going to license my work and you have to pay for the license. Yeah, using the trademark as a way to control what otherwise is copyright, it just doesn't work, right? I, I could take this Open UK trademark, or I could, well, let's just say this Open UK logo was baked into the code. It was like in a common header or something, right? And then I'll just put another comment in there that says, I'm not Open UK. And then it no longer becomes a trademark use, yeah. right? But it, also you can rip it out, so it is yeah. Something that we, we looked at back in the canonical days, and um, you can rip a trademark out of code in, I think it's seconds, you just run something and it's gone, and you're not using the trademark and you're not yeah. infringing it and you can still reuse the code. So it's more about the where the mark is used to buy third parties and making sure it's used in an appropriate way and well. Yeah, you should never rely on IP as insurance against making uh, potentially n against a decision that's fundamentally a business decision. The, the proportion of how much of your stack is open versus how much of your stack is closed is really hard, right? Because you have to, you have to 
you, you have to balance the benefits, whatever you're trying to get from being open, the adoption, versus what is a defensible now, today, tomorrow, and for all of time. That's a really, really hard thing to do. I used to be really critical of companies who did not guess correctly and then change their mind, right? Uh, but it's actually very, very hard to do. But you, you sort of, that's the, that's the fundamental decision. And, and, and the IP, like, just, just assume the IP will be stolen and copied and whoever, right? Because there's, uh, you know, even if you are able to take action, there's a lot of, there are, you, your ability to hold somebody's feet to the fire is only as good as, you know, the size of your war chest to be able to do that. And in many, in many jurisdictions, it kind of, it also even doesn't even matter how big your war chest is. Okay, I think we Just should... Just one thing on that. The, the other thing that goes yeah. with that is it doesn't matter how big your war chest is. You are going to disrupt your business hugely if you get into litigation. You're going to engage your senior management and you're going to distract them from their job, which is delivery. So I'm a bad ex-lawyer in as much as I would always, always have avoided litigation if I could. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it if, you know, if your feet were really against the fire, but I would do anything to avoid engaging my senior management team and time wasting. Okay. Um, so I was gonna ask a little bit about the move fast and break things culture. I think Matt, you mentioned there's the fear of American cousins kind of out-competing you. Uh, if, you if, if, if you go with a VC, there's gonna be pressure to deliver um, and they're gonna expect financial returns. So I think you've been pointed out as someone that was trying to do things for higher values. Um, and I guess not having the financial backing to move fast uh, is a problem uh, in some sense. But also, I guess the reason that I'm cautious about going down the VC route is move fast and break things in the sense of social media has arguably come close to breaking society. So, uh, yeah, the, I'm wondering kind of how you see trying to do, yeah, you know. I think it's, um, it's, it's a difficult question <laughs> and it really depends on the circumstances, which I'm trying not to give you a cop-out answer. <laughs> but um, I think uh, if you, I mean, the, word, the world is speeding up and that, that cash, you, you're competing at so many more people that the cash is very helpful. If I'm going to give you any advice, it would be pick a VC that's not just going to give you money, but is going to give you advice and connections and help in your particular space. Because just coming back to the, the question that was asked before around VCs, I think VCs have almost created the open source commercial um, like ecosystem in some ways. If, I mean, 10 years ago, I don't think you'd find many VCs that were willing to invest in open source companies. Well, very few. You had Mark, who was bankrolling it by himself personally, having become a billionaire in the 90s. And there were a certain number of VCs that did decide to take the risk and, and, they, and they invested in the companies that many of my friends have become very wealthy off the back of, Elastic, Confluent, MongoDB, you know, that, that sort of red hat, that, that sort of group of companies. Um, and um, so I think overall they're a force in, in a lot of ways for good. I think the problem uh, for open source comes when things start to go a bit awry and maybe early days founders take too much money than they need and they they have they're chasing equity values for evaluations that are very difficult to, to maintain and then maybe there's a found, founder that that, that 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 falls out with another one <laughs> or they miss a trend i mean there are certain companies i'm not going to mention any names that missed the kubernetes trend and they were trying to do their own orchestrator and compete against that rather than embracing it and then all of a sudden you don't have the uh, the same momentum that you had the year before and everything's hunky-dory when things are going great, but when your back's against the wall and you've lost money and you're not growing your customer base and your AOR's not going like that, VCs might start to become quite different <laughs> in the way they, they approach you. And at that point then, you may be forced to, to make decisions around license changes or the way that you think about selling your software to, to kind of make up for that. So they've been a fantastic force for good, in my opinion, VCs. I just think that the pressure from the capital has also led to some unusual outcomes that we might be dealing with in open source over the next 10 to 15 years. So I'm going to take this in a 
come to you, Heike. I, I, I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. We're talking open source here, right? So if you are a founder of a proper open source organization, and bearing in mind the conversations we've been having about curation and people starting to be more discerning about what open source they're using and looking at the supply chain, you are going to have a community and that's going to be hard work and that's going to be discussed in a session tomorrow. Um, you know, balancing the needs of a community versus the needs of a commercial entity is not an easy task. And it's one of the key things that will differentiate you from a founder of a, a non-open source organization. And they will keep you honest, like it or not, because they have power over you. They can fork. And that, I mean, Heike may want to talk about this as well, but it's one of those things where as time goes by, people will look more and more for healthy communities as one of the reasons to adopt open source. And if you take your, I mean, it, forking isn't easy, right? It's not this magic fairy dust thing. Forking is a lot of work, and who gets most contributions post-fork is the, the big thing. But you have to think of that in your overall picture, that you have a community who will keep you honest. And you need to be thinking about that and how you're giving back and how you're taking them with you as you grow your organization. I, I, somewhat, I, I, slightly, I do slightly disagree on this, on this point. I think um, I've got friends who do lots of studies into personas in companies that buy open source software and... Do they care that much about the community? Do they care about the license? If it does their job and they get value out of it in the company, they'll buy it. They don't think that much about it. And, I, 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 and so, yes, there's lots of benefits in a healthy community, and I feel very strongly about that, and don't get me wrong, but, but when, you, when it comes to corporate buyers and when money talks, they don't often care, I would say. And so the money is going to end up becoming more important Sadly, and you, and most open source founders will end up having this, this, this difficult line to draw between how much resources go to the community versus, versus the, the customer base and the, and the proprietary buyers in, in the enterprise. And that is, a, that is a topic entirely by itself, I would say. And I have opinions on that. But I'd say, ultimately, it's the, the, money, uh, the money talks. Um, I don't disagree to an extent in that money talks. I think code talks. And whoever has the contributions has the project long term. And I think we're going to see a shift in how we see large enterprises and public sector choosing the open source that they use. Now, he's not in the room, but he is here. Frank Karlaschek is a uh, founder of Nextcloud and also the founder of OwnCloud. And Frank's a bit of a hero of mine. I just love the fact that he forked his own business. So he'd taken 10 million of investment. He decided he didn't want to be part of that business anymore. He left it. He left the investment. He walked away from it, from his co-founder, from the business and he created Nextcloud. And one of the things I love about Nextcloud, I don't know quite what the staffing is in it now, and I think he's on a panel tomorrow, um, but the last time I talked to him about this, they had 45 employees in a community of 2,000, and it's rare, and it's super healthy. And if you want to be an open source founder, one of the, the reasons that you'll be driven there, I think, is your values. Now, that may be completely wrong as a statement because Luis Villa said to me not so long ago that you couldn't set up a business now in the Bay Area that's based on software without being open source. So I think increasingly we're seeing people who are going to it not because of the value set, but because of the potential for it to be a marketing tool. And that won't work in the long term. That will implode in my view. Yeah, can, I, can I add, add something here? I, this, this is really interesting for me um, b because it goes back to the one of the founding views of entrepreneurship, which is the idea of creative destruction, okay? So creative destruction can happen quickly or it can happen over a long period of time. But the only way we innovate is if we... So creative destruction is when we destroy something, but we create something new. And, and certainly, if we look at, um, you know, climate challenge, um, biodiversity, We've got, to, we've got to stop doing what we're doing. So we've got to destroy some of the practices and we've got to create new ones that allow us to address um, th those challenges. Um, so, so that phrase, creative destruction, is hot, hotly contested. Um, I think what Zuckerberg said when he was talking about um, move fast and break things, I mean, that's just being deliberately provocative. I mean, let, let's... And, and there's been so much written about it there's been more written about it than actually it valued being written about. Because the reality is, 
Um, the, the way in which the world is moving, it's moving into communities and ecosystems. And I don't believe that that sort of ethos, those values align with do things quickly. I, I, I really don't believe that because I, I think if you try to do things too quickly, whatever ecosystem you're in will react against you because what you're doing is actually not good for that ecosystem. So I, I, I think you know, things are moving at such a fast pace now. Um, but I actually think in today's um, context that creative destruction is a much more powerful way of thinking about this. And it really does draw on the community and the ecosystem in a way that move fast and break things doesn't. So I think move fast and break things in the way in which it was originally spoken about and intended isn't fit for purpose. But I think creative destruction is. So I, you know, I, I think innovation for good is a good thing. And that will combine people, planet, purpose, process, and profit. Okay, so profit's not a dirty word. It will include that as well, but not at all cost. Because if it is at all cost, I believe the community around you will really have something, you know, to say about that. As someone who used to be at Facebook, I have no comment. <laughs> okay, we did have a, a gentleman up the back wanting to ask uh, another question. And then we will go, yeah, we're just I'll following. Right, I want to, to uh, touch on a couple of topics. Really great panel, thank you, and very important things. And um, I promise to be here one of the founders as well. So if any time later over drinks you want to discuss any of these topics, I'm kind of I'm on fire, <laughs> uh, looking looking forward to this discussion. I want to first defend VCs a little bit. Um, I hear we are VC funded, so kind of there there might be some somewhere a point when you have ten employees and then you are looking at the balance sheet. That some, if something happened, I'm now responsible for these guys. Uh, next paycheck. So then it becomes, it's no longer your per own personal risk, but you're a, 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 uh, then you're responsible for others as well. And that was a uh, kind of point where uh, Ivan, uh, we looked at uh, uh, VC funding for the first time to really be, be able to expand and make sure that we have a runway and we can take additional risk and, and uh, growth profiles. But I would say that um, when you're pitching to uh, investors, or if you are, then also do reference checks on the investors as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of ask around how, how, how they behave with founders, especially when things, things got tough. In, in essence, the founders, they are, the VCs, they have the same goal. They, wanna, they want a business to succeed. And especially with the smaller startups, if the core team leaves for, for if, if things don't uh, pan out, the investment is essentially zero. Uh, a, a project that is in early phases, if it loses its core members, it's, it's, it's worthless um, for the most parts. Um, yeah, and wanted to quickly take on that the creative destruction and failing, uh, failing fast. I think that's that's also something that is uh, is a uh, is a uh, is one of the powers what makes a difference why startups can move that fast is that they can try out things and then adjust the course. So the decisions that we need to do now, if we can uh, see uh, tomorrow on how did they end and adjust and move faster, it's typically much faster to try out things than try to analyze what's the best course of action to take. But it's very different than when you start to look at enterprises that have tens of thousands of people. You can't go, just go about and do recklessly uh, trials uh, every day. But that's, that's why also startups are in a, such a great place to really challenge the market and incompetence and figure out new uh, business model, figure out how to respond to business need. Thank you for the comments. You're actually hearing there from a real life uh, billion dollar baby in your yeah. terms yeah. <laughs> who's uh, Ivan's uh, worth I, I don't know uh, multi-billions <laughs> yeah well, and, and, and founder as well so that's there's some amazing advice I think um, just just to come back to the move fast and break things I think just to pick up what you were saying there you are you do have a tremendous opportunity as a startup to out compete enterprises that I now know and see move incredibly slow with unbelievable bureaucracy red tape whatever you want to call it you know, tra uh, wading through treacle type thing. So if you have an idea, even if they if they have the same idea as you and they think it's just as good and they want to invest in it, it's going to take them six months to, to create, you know, to go through the board to create a team to do it and then they're going to have to work out how they're going to build it and, it, and they, they're going to be like a year or two years behind you doing it now. So you have a great opportunity. And on the move fast and break things, 
one of the things that I often feel is that terms like that are a marker of like this cult of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. where you know it's kind of cool to sort yeah. of like throw these terms at and you know it, it's not worth a billion it's worth a billion a million it's worth a billion and you know if we, and when I started uh, Jetstack uh, oh let's just get an office in WeWork we'll get the VC funding in we'll take a million dollars and you know we're, we're on our way we'll be successful and and it just totally like misunderestimates the amount of <laughs> real difficult hard graft that actually goes into it. And I feel like you just have to be a little bit careful of getting carried away with these tropes that people kind of like, you know, almost um, sort of align around, you know, and, and just really like get real and sort of like take it back to, to basics and work out what you need to do, how you're gonna do it and and not get carried away by that sort of, um, I don't know, the, the, the marketing hype of what it is to be an, an entrepreneur and a founder. Yeah, maybe if I can add there. I think it's also, it's not necessarily breaking things, but I think it's accepting and learning to uh, work with failures and learning from those failures, creating an open culture where the fl failure is not to, not to be blamed about, but it's a kind of, it's we learn some something new from that, and then we can do another experiments. I love that, I think it was Edison who said that he didn't fail a thousand times, he just found uh, ten, uh, 1, 1,000 ways how the light bulb didn't work. So it's a learning experience rather than a fear of failure. Yeah. I think we've got, I'm conscious of time, so I think we, I did promise this gentleman we'd go back to him for one last question. Um, oh, the mic's coming too. While, you, while you're getting that, I'm just going to add something to what's been said. So I'm a middle-aged woman, and I don't think it would be particularly easy for me to have gone from being a lawyer to walking into a VC or anywhere else and to have got funding. And there's at least one or two other middle-aged women who are engineers here who I've had this conversation with. And they've been told when they wanted to found that they wouldn't get money. And for me, one of the reasons, the personal benefit I've got out of the last three and a half years of Graft at Open UK is I wanted to prove I could do this. I wanted to prove I could build something. And I was tired of being a lawyer, I didn't want to be it. And there was nobody who was just going to give me money or take me on to be a, a CEO or a COO of a commercial organization from a GC role, it just wasn't gonna happen for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's all sorts of different reasons that we do different things. And I would love to found something, although I'm not technical, and grow it. But the, you're more technical than me. Uh, and I didn't think I could sell until now, and I think I probably can. Um, but the, the thing that, uh, I was just picking up on what you were saying there about Ivan, is I don't know if I've got the stomach to be responsible for other people's lives. It's the one thing that puts me off. And the, you know, I remember sitting in a, a, a pub with Mark talking about the weight of responsibility of everybody's salaries and making sure that they and their families and all of that would be taken care of. And I think if you have this drive to be a founder, it's not just about being driven, it's also about being accountable and responsible. And that's the one thing now that puts me off is the fact that I don't know if I wanna be responsible for people's families. It's a big responsibility, yeah. It is. Last question. Yeah, um, so it's, I'm kind of delighted I put that statement out earlier about, you know, companies growing or whatever, and, and it wasn't a judge, uh, a judgment or anything on founders and founders I've worked with over the years. But what I think is lovely has come out of this is, and maybe, you know, sometimes we look at founders and we think it's amazing and the founders go and do this. The human side doesn't come out in it, and the man that touched on it, and Matt saying, well, I was in an apartment with one child and, uh, you know, I need to make money. And, you know, it's like Michael touching as well around the whole fact that, like, you know, sometimes the companies that have made it big, you know, they maybe had the family money behind them. So, you know, they had a chance of growing on it. So it, it is really interesting here sometimes that, you know, we expect founders, we expect them to keep going. We see open source projects that are created, and yes, they're created for love and all that, but there has to be an infliction point where money is made off it. And I just wonder sometimes when, when we look at it is, when we look from the outside and we look in at a founder and stuff like that, and we're, are we judging or looking at them? It's like, is it like someone at the, you know, at the poker table? You, you enjoy watching the person playing the poker, but you say in your own mind, that's not my money, or it's like, you know, I always tried to figure out what a um, philanthropist was. And the more I looked at it, philanthropist to me seemed to be someone who had loads of money anyway. So the idea that they were giving away money, you know, you can become philanthropist once you have money. So it's, 
it's very interesting to see this human side and, and I love the stories that, that Matt told and the rest of you told on it, so yeah. Thank, uh, that's a, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, founders have soft sides and human sides too. <laughs> um, but um, I think uh, there's definitely um, a, like, like I was saying before, like a cult of the, of the founder that, you know, belies actually the real stuff that's going on uh, behind the scenes. I think it is right that founders get challenged and they get brought to account. And uh, I massively welcome that in Jetstack because we've made so many good decisions by having something called Building Jetstack, which Beth runs, where we, it's almost like a, it's like a forum on which everyone can have a, have a discussion around a decision that's going to get made that impacts the whole company. So if a, if a policy change happens around our paternity leave, for example, I, can't make, I won't just make that decision. It will go through building Jetstack, and, and everyone will have a chance to kind of stress test that. Ultimately, I have to make the, the, the final decision, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Um, well, it, it, it could, but it would take a, lo a lot of time. And so I'm always held to account. I, always, you know, we, I think we build a culture. Um, we build a, a culture of that. But it does get to the point where sometimes founders, um, thankfully not me, get so much criticism or focus, or you know, you're just looking at them through a certain lens. Um, someone used to tell me, well, if, 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 if you know, they end up that critical, then they should start a business themselves. And then they'll start to understand and learn <laughs> what it's really like. So I, I'd say it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an opportunity, but it also it's just a, a bit of a, a sense of the fact that there is a, a much more difficult and human side to the reality of starting a business. So hopefully today, We've managed to bring that out, and it just gives people just cause to, to think about what they're going to do with their <laughs> with their lives, basically. Uh, but it is an, an amazing thing, and if you can get it right, I mean, there's plenty of founders in this room that that will know that when you're on your stride, and your custom your customers are seeing value, your team's happy, and you know you, you've got that energy and that culture and that drive. There's nothing. There's literally nothing nothing better than that. So I know quite a few of the founders in the room and the, the ones who will be here tomorrow and they are all very different and individual. I was a lawyer for 25 years and I worked for founders not just in tech companies and unusually perhaps I worked for founders who had PLCs a couple of times and there is a personality type. So if I was to look at me in Canonical or in my time as a, a lawyer for 25 years, I was very different from the way I am in running an organization and building it. And the personality type is one where there is more risk tolerance, drive, determination. Peter Zaisev says to me to ask to be forgiven and not to worry about it up front. And that sort of personality where you're asking for forgiveness rather than worrying about what people think you know, I think there's a kind of person that can be a founder and there's a kind of person that can't. Now, I'm not saying that you, you can never learn to be one or an entrepreneur, but I think there are certain personality traits that you have to have if you are going to be successful as a founder. And I think perhaps too many people are founders now, and I know that's probably controversial, but you don't have to be a founder. There's no shame in working for an enterprise. Yeah, the... the I would actually, you know, my journey has been working for many enterprises, and uh, and I think I think either way is is one 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 you know flipping back and forth is definitely a really great way to to kind of view both sides of it. I'm I'm now sort of more or less on my own than I was before, and uh, it's uh, there's there's this joy that you get when every time you make this change of Having, you know, either 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 having the safety of a large corporation or having a regular job, and the, you know, I, I've I've actually throughout my career, I've, I've really enjoyed making that change, flipping it over and over and over again. Um, yeah. Okay, so I I think that's probably a, a good place for us to stop. My response would be, um, <clears throat> I, I think anyone can, through being exposed to certain scenarios develop more of an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think we need more of that open, curious, inquisitive mindset, which exists within founders, but we need more of it within other sectors as well. Um, we need more of it in government. We need more of it in big business um, because we've something's got to change if we're going to get ourselves out of the climate mess that we're in 
the financial mess that we're in and um, all of the other problems that we're facing right now. So I agree with Amanda. I don't think being a founder is for everyone. But I do think through education, we can all be a little bit more entrepreneurial in our mindset. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we should try to embrace that open UK, open mindset is where I think we should end. Um, can we show a round of applause for our panellists, please? Um, and, and remember, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Um, Amanda, do you want to say a little bit of what's um, now happening? Please don't go. Uh, 5.30, Brian Bellingdorf is DJing. He says it won't be too loud and it'll be nice and ambient just outside there. And there's drinks and we can't hear him in here, so he can't be that noisy. And then we've got Circus Alba, who are performing in this area at 6.30. And then Dommy Top will be loud and noisy, and you can stay and listen to loud and noisy from 7. There's the uh, tents out on the lawn. There's a magician upstairs on 4. Drinks will be wherever you find them. I don't exactly know where they are through the building. But please stay and enjoy the evening as well. And thank you all very much. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.